Good morning from beautiful Talkeetna, Alaska. Uh, well, morning in Alaska still. I think it's still morning on the Pacific Coast, but uh, uh, wherever you are, good morning, good afternoon. Um, first off, I wanted to say a big shout out, thank you to Rob Stapleton with Alaska Photo. That's with an F. You might notice some differences today in the video quality, and that's because he generously provided us a bunch of expensive equipment to be able to not only do this, but for tomorrow's big deal, which I'm sure you all know, tomorrow is the raffle. Uh, we are going to go live to announce the winner of not only the plane, but 11 other amazing gifts that were sponsored um, as prizes for this giant raffle that we've all been waiting for. So um, tomorrow, 4.30, we start the feed live right here from above Alaska's hangar with the Alaska Airmen's Association. Uh, the feed will also be on their Facebook page. And for your friends that don't have Facebook, uh, they're going to embed a live link on the Airmen's website. So they can link right in there and watch the whole raffle go down. Um, and so tune in tomorrow, 4.30, for announcing the winner. winners. Uh, meanwhile, today I just wanted to open one last package for you. As you guys know, we've been opening all these packages. The only problem with this one is that we kind of already opened it. So there it is. The 2020 Alaska Airmen's Association raffle airplane, 1955 Cessna 180, but it's more like a 2020 souped up hot rod Cessna 180. So there it is in all its amazing glory. Um, today, I wanted to just open it up to you guys. If you have any questions, raffle plane, anything, process, um, anything, go ahead and ask us and we would be happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, the other thing I wanted to tell you guys is that we flew it. I've actually flown it twice now and stand by very shortly today. Sarah's put together an amazing video for you that um, is the maiden voyage and it's going to be awesome. I've seen a little bit of it. She's doing some final tweaks on it and it's a cool pump up motivating video to get excited for the raffle. Um, and when you do watch it, make sure you crank the sound up because in Sarah's true way, she's, she's got it edited awesome to where it's worth cranking the sound. So, um, I guess I can go through this whole thing with you guys and tell you all the cool stuff we did to it. We have a question first. Oh, question. Awesome. Uh, Matt would like to know, was it heavier or lighter than you predicted? Uh, definitely heavier. Um, it's hoping for lighter, but the cool thing is that after we weighed it, I went back and looked at what it weighed before, and I think it lost 89 pounds. So that's awesome. Um, but you know, in retrospect, you think about everything we did to it, it's gonna add weight. So I was hoping for high 16s, ended up being high 17s. So with that being said, Russell would like to know what is the payload? So the useful load, which is the difference between what it weighed on the scales and the max gross weight is 1100 and what was it? I forget what it was, 1135, something like that. So essentially you could put uh, four 200 pound people and full fuel, or you could put three 200 pound people, full fuel and full baggage. So it's almost unlimited, but there is still some limits to not going over gross. Um, but depending on what type of floats it's on, and I'd have to look into that some more if, if the whip air floats that come with it um, would give you a gross weight increase. Um, I believe it does. So you'd be able to on floats carry a little bit more. Okay, and for those who don't remember, can you tell us what the um, weight was, the empty weight? 1795, 80, 85 or 95, 1795, I believe. Um, it's an early model, so that actually 
helps because the early models, the Cessna didn't beef them up and add all these mods to them to make them heavier. Uh, they did that throughout the progression of production. So the later models usually weigh more, you know, 1900, pushing 2000 pounds. Uh, so that's one of the reasons we wanted an early model is to try to keep it light. A close up. All right, Sarah's fiddling around with the, there we go. She pulled the phone out of a fancy gimbal system. So, um, where are we going? Um, we want to take a look inside and people want to know, has she flown? She did. And so how did she fly? Let me tell you about the test flying. So first of all, it's extremely nerve wracking to be a test pilot. Um, I don't fly very often. I've used to fly a whole bunch, but I don't fly very often. And usually most of my flying is in the raffle plane right before it goes away to the winter. Um, so I'm always, the few days before starting to get shaky, trying to calm my nerves. I know I got to fly this thing, but um, I calm myself down and take a few deep breaths before I cob the power to it. So one of the things that we had to deal with with this airplane because of what it is, and because this winter we had a ton of snow. So our runway is a 2,500 foot grass runway with 60 foot trees on both ends. And it's sev ordinarily 75 foot wide, but we had so much snow that we still have big mounds of snow out there. And so essentially the runway was about 45 foot wide and then snow berms. The wingspan on this is 39 and a half feet. So there's not a lot of room for air. Um, you pilots probably know this, but those that aren't pilots, when you go to take off, you get all these torquing effects that cause the airplane to want to go to the left. The more horsepower you have, the more that tendency occurs. We upgraded this engine and the prop, and it's pumping out way more than what an original Cessna 180 could do. So in order to keep the airplane from veering off the runway to the left, that's why that vertical stabilizer is back there. But this airplane was designed to have a lower horsepower engine, so it's got a smaller vertical stabilizer. So it's not enough to allow you to just cob the power to it and bring in full right rudder. It'll still go to the left. So what I had to do is slowly advance the throttle so that we didn't get that high left turning torque and it allowed the airplane to accelerate so I had good rudder authority. So I had to keep that in mind. I couldn't just give it the coals. So I had to be gentle on the throttle advancement about maybe a six second to full power and didn't run out of rudder effectiveness, was able to stay on center line. And let me tell you, between this prop and what's turning it, the thrust is phenomenal. It literally, you can feel it yanking you back in the seat and you're just holding on for dear life as this thing rips off the runway. And even with that slow advancement, it was probably a 300 foot takeoff. This thing could probably do, I know it would do way better than that if you had a wider runway. Um, so climbed like crazy. Um, and usually my first test flight is get it airborne, make sure I'm ready in case something's out of rig to where it wants to pull a wing down or um, you know something to that effect. Um, didn't, it flew totally straight, perfect. No pull, no wing heaviness at all. And then I fly kind of a wide pattern, a big rectangle, and on my downwind leg, I lower the nose, pull the power, prop back, get it into cruise, see what it cruises at. On this particular test flight, when I did that, the left door popped open because there's a venturi effect with that air going around you. The faster you go, the more suction you get out of the fuselage. So the door latch needed a little bit of adjustment. And I found that out the hard way when the door popped open at 120 miles an hour, it's like an explosion going off. And then it sounds like the windshield came out and the wind's ripping through. So remember I'm doing this already and boom, door comes open and I'm like, ah, control the airplane, control yourself, fly the plane. So I, I, I knew I needed to slow down. So I brought the power back, pulled the nose up, reached over, was able to latch the door back and 
take a few deep breaths. <laughs> uh, and then I thought, you know, I'm not going to see what this thing can cruise at right now because the door might do that again. And, but I did want to stall it. So stalling is not the engine dying. It's where you increase your angle of attack on the wings to the point where it can't sustain lift anymore and the air burbles off the wing. Um, and the reason to do that is multi multifold. One is to find out what the stall characters or characteristics are like to see if it drops a wing in the stall, um, to see if it aggressively noses over. Um, the other thing it's telling me is what's my airspeed. Um, it's kind of cool to know how slow it'll fly. And it's also good for coming back into land. Again, we have those tall trees, semi shorter runway. I want to make sure that I can get it as slow as I can within comfort um, so that I can, I have plenty of runway. Um, and you're probably, somebody's probably already typing, what did it stall at? Well, at 1500 RPM level flight, the pitot tube is a little bit angled up, so it's probably not 100% accurate, but it indicated 23 miles per hour. And part of that is, well, most of that is the wing. It's got the leading edge cuff, it's got the vortex generators, it's got wing extensions, it's got everything you need to fly slow. So, um, and then I essentially brought it back home at a, actually, if I do say so myself, a pretty smooth and successful landing. Um, and you'll see that in the video that Sarah will be posting here in a bit. Um, let's see, what else we got? We have lots of questions. Oh, cool, bring them. Um, so they can't hear me, so you're going to have to repeat the questions. Okay, I will repeat your questions. Okay, let's go back here a ways. What is the actual gross takeoff weight? 2,950 pounds is the gross weight of the airplane. Um, and originally this airplane was 2,550 pound gross weight. And the way we were able to increase the gross weight on that is what you see right here. So this, this is not the original wingtip. This is a, one of the mods um, that we a sponsor put on here. I'm not gonna go through and name all the sponsors right now. We're gonna do that tomorrow. But um, if anybody has any specific question who, who made that, I'd be happy to tell you. But uh, anyhow, so this section here is a whole add-on. Uh, originally this wingtip would mount right here. So when you add that, it increases your wing area um, that's this is an 18 inch extension um, part of that mod because not only are you increasing your lift but you're putting additional stresses throughout the airplane um, so when you do that you have to increase the strength of the airplane or the wing and there's two things that happen there and one of them is it's kind of hard to see because these are all flush rivets but this whole section this is where the main structural spar of the wing is the front spar and to make that stronger so that essentially the wing doesn't break right here you have to drill out a bunch of those rivets slide a doubler strip in between this skin and this skin and then rivet that all together and that beefs up that that section of spar that's the weak area and of course being a certified airplane anything you do to it you have to have engineering and certification and so when that wing extension was getting certified, they did all kinds of testing and realized that there's a weak spot and we have to beef that up in order to carry an extra weight. There's also one on the rear spar up on the top of the wing. So that's how you get the increase in gross weight. Okay, and then we have a question of which VG kit did you put on it? This is the Micro Aerodynamics Vortex Generators. Um, they've always been a huge supporter of the raffle plane. Um, I've put these on my personal planes they are uh, they're the go-to company and it is a mod worth doing it doesn't weigh hardly anything um, and by vortex generators that's these guys right here so when the wind comes over it creates a little swirl um, and that helps keep the wind on top or the air on top of the wing for when you go to stall when you get slow it, so that the air doesn't 
break away from the top. It keeps it injected so you can fly slower. The other thing it does is it helps with your stall characteristics. Typically a stall, when you're pulling back and losing airspeed and that airflow no longer stays to the back of the wing and it breaks apart, the nose of the airplane drops. And it's usually pretty aggressive. It's like, boom. And now you're pointing at the ground and you gotta get your airspeed back up and fly again. Um, with these, because of that, the, the stall is a lot smoother. It doesn't just break away the back of the wings. It kind of just starts to slowly come apart. So you actually start kind of just getting mushy and the airplane just kind of does this. So it's not an aggressive now, which is handy when you're flying really slow, close to the ground, trying to land really short. You don't want the nose of the airplane to do that when you're 10 feet off the ground. So it kind of helps you and kind of warns the pilot, hey, you're getting slow, but it keeps it controllable. What is the total fuel capacity? Uh, it's 60 gallons, which is 55 usable. Total fuel capacity, they can't hear me. Oh, total fuel capacity, I'm sorry. I forgot to repeat the question. The question was, what is the total fuel capacity? And it is 60 gallons. And we have a question about useful load with floats. Um, so that kind of goes back to, so the question is, what's the useful load on floats? And we don't have the floats. They are in Minnesota. They are going to be there until they, we determine who the winner of the plane is. And then there'll be arrangements made to get the floats to the winner, which may be anywhere in the world. So rather than bring the floats here, only to have to send them, who knows, maybe back to Minnesota. So um, with that said, I haven't gone through the paperwork to find out what the gross weight is. Maybe somebody at Whip Air is watching and can answer that question, but I know that it will be at least 2950, possibly higher depending on what the gross weight of the floats are. The people would like to know, is the engine fully broken in and what is the oil type? Great question. So the question is, is the engine broken in and what oil is in it? Um, the short answer is yes. Uh, so at Lycon, when they rebuilt the engine, they ran it on a test stand for three and a half hours. So that gives it the initial break in. Ordinarily, if they hadn't done that and we got a raw engine that hadn't been run, we would have to mount it up, get everything going airworthy, and then we would have to fly it for an hour at 75% power with full rich mixture. So you're getting the cylinders hot, but not overheating them. And what that does is it seats the rings inside the uh, cylinders and the pistons so that you get a good seal. If you don't do that, then oil will blow by there and you'll have low compressions and it just doesn't set the engine out on the proper course. Um, so that's already been done at Lycon. With that said, the next 25 hours is still break in. So a um, couple things that the winner needs to do is try, it's, it's a bummer that you have to burn an extra fuel, but it's going to save the engine in the long run. Um, so you need to run a rich mixture wherever you can. You yeah, can adjust for altitude if you have to, but you want to try to keep the fuel to it to keep the engine cooled down. Um, and then the question regarding the type of oil, it currently has Phillips 20W50 in it. And that is a, a good oil because you can run it uh, for the life of the engine. You don't you, there's there's break-in oil and then there's regular life running oil. The break-in oil is usually a mineral, straight mineral oil, and it allows um, buildup to occur, which helps seal things up internally inside the engine. Um, but you can then swap over to a, a multi-grade oil that helps clean the engine. Um, with the 20W50, you can run it for the life of the engine, including break-in. So that's why we put that in there. Uh, what other questions do we have? So, <laughs> everybody really wants to see inside. Oh. Possibly with the master on to light up the instruments? Well, why don't I, you stay here. I'll go show you what happens on the outside when we turn the master on. The question also, I forgot to repeat, um, was can we turn the master on and see inside? So 
This thing lights up like a Christmas tree. There is no way that you can fly at night and not be seen unless you turn all your switches off. But it's got, okay, let's see. We have tip strobes. And if you can get the whole thing in there, they're actually synced. So the, the, the strobes are kind of hard to see from this angle, but the main flashing you're seeing is what's called a wigwag. And that's tip to tip. You see it alternating back and forth. That wakes anybody up that's flying around you and they see that and they go, whoa, there's somebody there. That switch can be turned off and both of those will stay on. And then you can also select whether you want taxi, which aims down towards the ground as you're taxiing, or landing, which aims forward as you're on approach. Um, they're super bright LED lights. Um, so low current draw, but extremely bright. We also have the, the original wingtip light position or the uh, leading edge light position on the left wing, your right right now. And those are also LED. We replaced out the halogens for LED. Um, and then we have the nav light, which is on the right wing, the, the green one. And I gotta try not to look at those because they are bright. Uh, and then there's also the tip strobe that you can see flashing there. And the tip strobe is synced in with the other tip and the tail, which if you can get, I don't know if you can get all three of those in there at the same time, but you have the tail strobe on the very bottom of the aft end of the tail, and then you have the beacon that's red up on the top, and then you have the wingtip strobe. So those are all flashing simultaneously all, at all four points around the plane. So that's the, the light show. Um, we'll go flip the lights back on and. Oh, uh, we got a couple of hidden lights actually. Um, let's say you're out camping under your wing and it's nighttime. Maybe you can turn that light on. And it's obviously daytime right now, so it can't tell it's very bright, but it's it's actually really bright. And these are pretty cool because there's just a little battery pack, double A's on the back side of it flip the switch and you got light. There's one of those on each wing. So that'd be really convenient for night camping under your wing. You can like having your own little lantern attached to your plane. We also have a hidden light over here that's really cool. So this is the plug for the engine preheat system. And you just turn that little guy and the door opens up and you have a, an outlet you plug into. And when you do that, this little light here turns red to tell you that your preheat system is charged and working and operational. So if you're running a long line out to the plane and you're not sure if you plug the other end in, you don't have to go back and check because if that light comes on, you got power. So, um, let's turn the lights off and I will light up the instrument panel for you guys. So the other cool thing we did is the doors. Ordinarily, they don't stay open like this. They tend to do this. And because of gravity, they stay here when you're, when you're on the ground. And so when you're trying to load stuff in, you're constantly holding the door open and it's banging against you. This has door stewards, so you just do that and kind of like a DeLorean, except not that up. That was cool, do that again. <laughs> okay. So opens right up for you, and the other cool thing is they pop right off, and what did that is this shock strut down here, kind of like your back hatch on your minivan. That's a little plug for the soccer moms. Uh, so you can pop this right off and then pull your two hinge pins and the whole door comes off too. So if you needed to get in there, you could do that. So take a look at that instrument panel. So these things are pretty cool. Um, it, it took me a, actually a lot less time to get used to them and understand them than I thought it was gonna take. But let me go around the other side and I will talk to you guys about these. They're pretty cool. So, climb up. 
up in here. So you can change what you see on here with a simple boom or simple boom. Um, there's a lot more you can do inside these than I know, which is something that the winners just going to have to sit down and study. Um, but I've got it figured out to where I've got the basic knowledge of what to do. Um, there is a PFD and you can move it side to side or make it full screen. Um, you this, out of the way? this the helmet? Mm -hmm. um, but you have a, an airspeed ticker over here. It tells you what your max speed is up top, 184. That same display is over here. So you can move all this stuff around. You can also set it up for a six pack. So you can just have your six standard instruments right there. So you essentially have a dial like everybody's used to, or you can have the PFT, um, which is primary flight display. And it shows your airspeed as you can, as you click through here, these three dashes will show your actual airspeed. It'll show your true airspeed down below and your ground speed. So you'll know which way your winds are going and how fast you're actually traveling across the ground. It's got altitude over here um, and a simple turn of these buttons adjust your barometric pressure our field elevation is uh, 400 feet if i wanted to i could call in and find out what the actual barometric pressure is and set that but real simple turn of a knob just that and then you have a vertical speed indicator over here showing you whether you're climbing or descending and then of course you have essentially an attitude indicator you have a, a ball tell you whether you need to step on a pedal or not and then you have a heading indicator that shows all that information. Um, and then, of course, you have the full moving map. Let's see if I can do that. Okay, so here's your whole moving map um, with terrain, terrain alerts. When you, she talks to you also over the headset. It's pretty wild. Um, she's got a nice voice. And <laughs> she tells you, um, uh, like right now we got a caution because the compass needs to be calibrated. Um, and it will tell you caution. And you just hit that caution button and it'll tell you what your caution is. Um, and then it will also give you terrain alerts. Um, the other cool thing about this is that it is full ADSB compliant. So ADSB is a traffic alert system. So this map will show you all the other airplanes that are out there flying around. Um, I, we're here in Talkeetna, we're kind of remote. And as I'm sure everybody is experiencing, we don't have a lot of air traffic right now, but I believe that on the PFT screen, you will actually see the other traffic and their altitude above or below you. So awesome collision avoidance so you got the lights to keep you from hitting anybody and you got all this to keep you from hitting anybody so you have these two displays and then you have this display over here which is essentially a basic version of one of these and this is required as a backup because we don't have any what are called steam gauges in this which are you know, mechanically driven standard gauges and in order to get rid of those, you have to have a backup. So this guy has an internal lithium ion battery that will last an hour if you lose uh, airplane electrical power. This guy has its own one hour backup battery. This guy has its own one, up backup, one hour backup battery. So each one of these is independently powered if the ship goes uh, dark. Um, So the, this guy over here is your engine analyzer and it gives you all kinds of cool parameters on what's going on inside that engine. Um, so up top there is a, uh, your, your main engine stuff, your manifold pressure, which is your power and your RPM, which is your prop. And then Below that, you have your percent of horsepower, outside air temperature, and then a bar graph that shows all of your, each cylinder's exhaust gas temperature, um, manifold pressure, I'm sorry, not manifold pressure, cylinder head temperature. And then 
We have volts, amps, uh, fuel used, fuel remaining, the time till empty on fuel, and then you have your sliding uh, fuel gauges, which are actually the only fuel gauge on the airplane that is being sent information from um, sensors in the tanks that are feeding back to this to tell you how much fuel you actually have in your plane. So it's not a calculated fuel, it's an actual fuel, which is awesome. And then up top of that, you have oil temperature, oil pressure, carburetor temperature. Um, and then you can flip through all kinds of settings in here. So you can, you can run Lena Peak or if you want, um, there's all kinds of stuff you can do in there, which is pretty cool. Um, we mounted the push to talks into the yokes. So they're right there, no cords laying around, nothing like that. Um, and then we have the electronic ignition and the, the regular ignition, which is mounted right up here, which tells or which is controls your standard mag on the left switch and the electronic ignition on the right switch. And then the red button is your start button. So all that's in one consolidated little panel, no big key. Um, there is no key, which is kind of cool. Um, there is a door lock key, so you can lock the door so that nobody comes in and steal your plane. And of course, all your switches and circuit breakers. Um, what else we got? Um, all new interior panels, flooring, Italian leather seats. Um, we have a question. Question. Question is, does it have the factory float kit? It does have the factory float kit. That was one of the requirements that we sought out to find in this airplane. Um, I actually looked at buying an airplane that didn't have a factory float kit in order to start with and putting one on and it's way too intense to do that. The other cool thing is with the factory float kit, the reason that's so highly sought after is the before the factory assembles the fuselage and the wings and all that, they prime everything and then they rivet it all together. So you can imagine trying to do that after it's built. It's pretty much impossible. So you can do it afterwards, but you can't get that corrosion prevention inside. So this has got all that and the uh, factory float kit. Yes. So <laughs> what is the airspeed of an unladen swallow? <laughs> <laughs> Well, the question is, what is the airspeed of an unladen uh, swallow? And it's not a very specific question because it depends on whether it's an African swallow. <laughs> okay, so, all right. With 55 gallons unusable plus the new power plant, what range time aloft can one expect? All right, uh, question is with the 55 usable gallons of fuel and the upgraded uh, engine, what's the endurance flight time? Um, and I don't have an exact answer on that because I haven't flown this enough to be able to dial in the fuel flow. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, the engine's still in break-in, so we're running full rich. I would imagine that once you get the engine broke in and you start using this engine analyzer um, if you stay rich of peak which is going to be less fuel efficient which is the standard um, you're probably going to be burning in cruise somewhere around 14 gallons per hour so if you just rounded that to 15 you've got three and a half hours of range um, however if you dial it back to lean a peak I've seen these things run at like nine nine and a half gallons an hour so that really increases your range um, but a lot of people it's kind of a controversial subject as to whether that's a good thing or a bad thing and everybody's got a different uh, opinion on that so it's I'm really roomy in here yeah oh this is cool too oh wait wait, wait. okay go that is the latch for the baggage door and it's in the door jam of the pilot's door so you close your baggage door there's no handle on the baggage door and then you close your pilot's door and lock it and nobody can get into your baggage compartment um, and while you're back there the 
baggage compartment has been extended. Usually you can see where the gray flooring starts and the gray interior paneling starts. That's usually the end of your baggage compartment. But this has been extended and um, goes back quite a bit further and it allows an additional 50 pounds of baggage back there. Question. No, got a question. The people want to know. People want to know. Does the new prop still produce the old Skywagon wine? You, uh, so the question, uh, if you didn't hear it, does the new prop still produce the old Skywagon wine? And I would say no. It's not a two blade sound, but it has a scream that is, let's just say everybody know, will know that it's you flying the raffle plane when they hear you take off. Um, it's an 86 inch three blade. So that's a really long three blade prop. Um, and you will get to hear it after we are finished here and Sarah uploads the maiden voyage. We got a clip of the sound it makes. So turn the volume up. What else we got for questions? Anything? Yep, so Matt would like to know, any news from Dynon on getting it IFR certified? Great question. Any news from Dynon on whether, um, I gotta turn the master off, um, whether it can be IFR certified? And I would say no, I haven't talked to them. I haven't specifically asked them that. I have talked to them, but I haven't asked them that. Um, and maybe they're listening in right now and can comment on that. Um, I know that it's in the works, but I don't know when that's going to happen. Um, same with autopilot. They have an autopilot system that they're working on getting certified in here. And it's something that can be easily added on to it, both the autopilot and the IFR. So when that does happen, it's not like you missed out. You can add it, which would really make this airplane pretty incredible. Adds weight but it makes it a lot uh, more usable. Be able to fly in the clouds and hands-free. Any other questions in there? How do you get up to flip the caps? Oh, cool. I will show you. Set my coffee cup down. I'm assuming, so the question was, how do you get up to flip the caps? I'm assuming that means to get to the fuel caps. So you step on your tire, you grab this handle, grab the strut, step here, grab this little handle up here, and step on that step there. And then fuel cap. That's simple. How about I do it in reverse in slow-mo? I feel like Ace Ventura <laughs> at the Insane Asylum. So someone would like to know what are the odds of winning? So maybe how many tickets are sold? Um, odds of winning are if you bought one ticket, you have one in 14,000 chance of winning. And the more tickets you buy, the better your odds. Uh, of course, they're sold out now. So all, all 14,000 have been sold and they will all be here tomorrow for the lucky winner to be drawn. Um, yeah. Anything else? A lot. A lot um, of questions. Autopilot? Uh, it does not have an autopilot, but Dynon has an autopilot system that can, can be installed once they get proper certification for this airplane. Cessna 185 people are watching. Oh, cool. I guess the Cessna 185 pilots are watching. Um, what are the radios? Um, so it's kind of a cool system. The question was, what are the radios? Um, so Dynon partnered with Trig. And so instead of having a Trig head in the panel, 
that it wires to the, the avionic uh, radio itself that's remote mounted, they have Dynon's radio head wired to the trig radio. Um, same with the transponder. The transponder is integrated into the Dynon system. So that's where the ADSB transmits through uh, for traffic avoidance is through the transponder. So it's a combination of trig and Dynon and that's their, their certification. Dynons. So people want to know. People want to know. Are you going to cry when the airplane flies away? Um, I have to repeat the question. Am I going to cry when the airplane flies away? And the public answer yeah. is no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not going to cry. <laughs> uh, no, you know, it's it's a bittersweet thing. And this is the fifth one we've built for the airmen's, but we also build airplanes for the general public. And usually I get to test fly them, so I get to fly them, and some of them are really amazing. So it's, it's kind of cool to be in the position of spending other people's money building them their amazing airplanes, but I get to go fly them. So it's, uh, it's kind of cool, but it, it's something I'm used to. So... Um, the ones, the ones that I've been sentimental about were the ones that I owned, that I flew and got really used to and comfortable in. And then when they go away, that's kind of like, ah, oh, I missed that bird. That was such a fun one to fly. Um, this is, if I could ever dream of having a dream airplane, this is definitely it. So this is going to be a hard one to let go. But, I mean, it's kind of like, uh, I don't know, raising farm animals. You, you can't get attached to them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, new question. <laughs> new question. <laughs> Speaking of which, you've had several comments on how you are a man of many hats. Oh, you found out. <laughs> <laughs> Thought that would be fun. Oh, yeah. So, just some sponsor fun. Letting everybody see who, who, whoever sent a hat up with their sponsorship. I've been cycling them through this whole time, so, including the David Clark helmet. <laughs> so we have another question about sponsor stickers, mm. which are awesome and amazing, but someone wants to know, can you remove those? Yes, you can. Yep. Um, so, well, that door's open too, but so we, Obviously, try to give the sponsors as much recognition as we can. Um, and yes, they're stickers. They can peel right off. If you don't want to peel them off, you can leave them on and they'll stay indefinitely. Uh, but one of the things I'm putting those stickers on is this paint scheme is really busy. And the, really the only real estate was either where they're at or on the cowling up front on the nose. And so we actually take all those stickers before we peel the backings off and we put a piece of tape on there and we stick them on the airplane and we lay them out and then we stand back and go, mm, I don't know, maybe we can move that one there or that one there. And originally we put them up on the nose because that was the wide open obvious real estate, but it just looked really tacky. And so then I came and I put them all just in this area, but then that left kind of an open blank area that was not filled. So I spread them out and I think it actually looks really good. It makes, it, it tells, tells everybody this is the raffle plane. This is an important plane. Are there any other stickers on the plane? There are other stickers on the plane. Um, so I'm sure some of you watching right now have different opinions about the bear claw because Ever since we started this project and the paint scheme was selected, we've had comments about the bear paw. And so rather than painting the bear paw on, we put a vinyl sticker on. So if the winner doesn't like the bear paw, he can peel it off. If he likes it, he can keep it, or she. And then the tail uh, stars are stickers. And Again, if the winner didn't like the Big Dipper, they could take it off. But the cool thing about those star stickers is when we went to Fast Signs of Menominee Falls to get those stickers put on, uh, 
or made, they didn't have an exact yellow that matched the yellow on the airplane. It was more of an orange was the only option we had. But they said, we have the color that you're looking for, but they're reflective. And we thought, hey, why not? They're stars, right? Stars shine. And the other day I came in the hangar and the light was coming in here just right to where those stars looked like they were glowing. It was really cool. So, uh, you know, at night when you drive up, boom, you're gonna see stars shining back at you. Sarah is scrolling through looking for more questions. Are these stock fuel caps? Are the fuel caps stock? And the question or the answer to that is yes, they are. Um, it would have been nice to modify them, but you know, part of part of the raffle plane is a lot of a lot of decisions that have to be made in the name of time and efficiency. And when you're building something this complex you have to you have to be able to say no um, so certain things we just didn't have time to do it would have been nice to be able to do it all but when you have less than a year to build a one-of-a-kind show plane you have to make sacrifices so that's still also the case with the extended fuel it would have been nice to put extra fuel in it that would have increased the weight of it and to do that required essentially tearing the whole wing apart chopping it all up putting in doublers, putting the new tanks in and reskinning it. And that's just not something that we had the time to do. As you can see, we just flew it for the first time two days ago. So if it would have taken us two days longer to put in extra fuel or different fuel caps, this plane wouldn't be ready yet. So it's down to the wire every year. So for our non-Alaskan friends. Yes, I'll fly it to you when you win it. <laughs> Um, they would like to know, are the tires suitable for all types of terrain, dirt, grass, cement, etc.? So, question was, if it wasn't heard, are the tires suitable for any type of terrain? And the answer is, the short answer, yes. Um, the, they can land on pavement, they can land on grass, rocks. Um, I believe the 29 Alaska bush wheel says you can go up to an eight inch rock. Go stand next to them so you can see what they So these are 29s. They make a 31 that we could have put on here, but these have a heavy tread. So they're, they're better on heavier airplanes. Uh, there's better stability as far as when you're climbing over rocks and such, you don't get this wobbly squishiness. So they're a little bit more solid um, and they're, a, they're called a heavy tread, um, which would indicate to me that they can last longer as far as wear. Um, any, any tire, but especially bush wheels, you wanna be careful on pavement. One of the things that wears them out the fastest is uh, really surprisingly enough, it's not necessarily the landing and taking off on pavement that wears them out, but it's, it's the sharp turning when you're taxiing because it twists the tire. So what I've always done when I ran bush wheels was try to keep your turns wide and smooth and try not to lock up a brake and twist on a tire because it'll just chew the rubber off. So are the floats going to be painted to match the colors? The question is, are the floats going to be painted to match the colors? And the answer is yes. They are at Whip Air right now, and due to COVID, they are skeleton crew right now. But once that's taken care of, the floats get painted to match the airplane. So, how much does one of these cost? How much does one of these cost? Um, to build this retail, with labor and retail price on all the mods and parts on this. Um, I think we actually figured that out and it was just short of $400,000. So it's essentially a brand new, fully modified Cessna 180. And with that said, if Cessna was building 180s, which they aren't, they do build 182s. And I think the starting price on a 182 from Cessna brand new without all the mods is just short of $500,000. So essentially you're getting a brand new airplane with all the good mods on it for less than you can buy one from Cessna. 
Um, yeah. And with that said, believe it or not, we don't just build raffle planes. Above Alaska is an aircraft refurbishing company. So uh, we can build this for you. If you are unlikely, unfortunate enough to not win tomorrow, mm -hmm. give us a call, we can build you one. Uh, or a Cub, or a Satabria, or a Scout, or a Husky. Husky. Mm -hmm. Yep. Or a Mall. Or a Mall. Yep. Uh, so the tail wheel. Maybe we should go, we talked about yep. the main gear. What about this little tail wheel back here? Uh, it's not questions about the tail wheel. Um, so the tail wheel is from the Landing Gear Works. It's their proprietary setup. Um, just like the main landing gear, uh, the, the stinger, that big shiny post coming out of the tail of the airplane is titanium. And the, so the titanium stinger here is a larger diameter than the original. So the tail wheel head from an original 180 will not fit on here. This slides down into here and then gets bolted on. So you have to use their head. And in their certification process, they certified all this as well. So legally, you need to use this with this, with this. So this is all one unit that needs to be together. Um, it's a very large diameter tire, which is great for bouncing over rocks. And um, one of the things is the larger the diameter, the easier it is to you can imagine the bottom of your tire and there's a rock. It's easier to climb up onto that rock versus a smaller diameter that's going to have a hard time getting up over that rock. That was a horrible visual, but <laughs> yeah. So that's an advantage to the larger diameter tire. So real quick again, um, cruise speed and stall speed. Mm. Uh, question is cruise speed and stall speed. And actually I didn't even mention the cruise speed on my second flight after I fixed the door latch so it would stay open. I pushed the nose over and squared it up to 24 inches of manifold pressure and 2400 RPM and I was indicating 145 miles per hour, which was screaming. With those big tires, it was still going really fast. And it's kind of cool because I'm used to flying Cubs the last five years, well four years have been Cubs for raffle planes, so all those test flights have been going on, cruising around at 75, 80, 85 miles per hour. And when you level this thing off and it just starts screaming through the air, you're like, whoa, we're going fast. And so on a test flight, I try to stay close to home in case I need to put it back on the ground. And you know, I'm out there and three minutes later, I'm five miles away. It's pretty, pretty fast. So yeah, you'll get there quick. So one of the favorite uh, things people want to ask about the plane is the taxes, mm. which so the question is about taxes. How much does somebody have to pay in taxes if they win this? Um, and that is something that is worked out with the airmen's. And it's not something we deal with. We just build the airplane and technically the airmen's owns this now. It's their airplane. Um, and that's something that the winner, when they transfer ownership, works out the logistics with the airmen's. With that said, I have talked to previous raffle winners and sounds like it's in the thirty-five to forty thousand dollar range that the IRS gets their piece of the pie. Um, but I mean we're talking ten percent of the value or ten percent of what the airplane could resell for. Okay, so fuel burn at twenty-four square? Uh, good question, and I didn't look. Um, again, 24 square is full, full rich mixture because the engine's still in break in, um, and I didn't even look at it, but I would imagine it was probably somewhere up around 17, maybe. Probably lean it back, get better fuel efficiency out of it. And that's 17 gallons per hour, of course. What else? Got any other questions out there? Look at the interior. Sure. Let's go around the other side. That door is open. Where do you look through that door? Oh, okay. I'm going to look through this door. Mm. 
I know a lot of people have commented that they're intimidated by the, all the glass up there and give me old gauges, I'm old fashioned and all that. Um, it's actually not that difficult. Um, I was surprised. I thought I was going to have to sit there and study the manuals. It's all really user friendly. If you've got a smartphone, you can run those. It's no big deal. So, uh, and why not? Why not learn something new? If you've never flown a 180, does that mean that you don't like 180s because you're intimidated by them? You'd have to learn how to fly it if you win it anyway, so you might as well learn how to read the new gauges. Oh, someone wants to know if we've named her. <laughs> you know, I was thinking about that. The question is, have we named her? Um, it's not really our right to name it. It's not our airplane. The winner, definitely, that's their, their neck of the woods. Um, I was thinking about that this morning, though. And I was thinking about introducing her as Miss Alaska. <laughs> Bear, Northern Lights, Alaska flag colors, not Northern Lights, and Big Dipper. So, I don't know. Call it, name it whatever you want when you win it. It's your bird. So, okay, a couple questions. Uh, bubble windows. Mm -hmm. How many inches are they? Six. The question is bubble windows, how big are they? And they actually are six inches. Uh, which is really nice because you can stick your head into them and look oh. down. <laughs> you, like an, you look like an astronaut. <laughs> Houston. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's really kind of trippy when you do that. I've, I've stuck my head out those before and you look down and you're looking straight down at the ground and it feels like you're outside of the airplane. It's kind of cool. But good for, uh, you know, overflights seeing what your terrain's like down below when you're doing a runway inspection for off airport ops. Um, so, let's see, we have a question. Question. How is the floor covering held down and can you use something a rear seat? Still a rear seat? Uh, so the question is, how is the floor covering held down and can you install a rear seat, I think? Uh, Oh, can you stow the rear seats? Yes. So the floor covering is not held down. And the reason for that is because during annual inspection, the floor has to come up and it's just a vinyl mat that's laying there. Um, however, there are some areas that are secured. Um, you can see up here, this interior panel is on top of the floor, so it's screwed down. Same with the, the sides of that uh, center column. Um, so those areas would, those panels need to come off for inspection anyway, so all those screws would come out, panels come off, and then the floor comes right out, just rolls up. Um, and there's a, underneath that flooring is a whole bunch of inspection panels that are held in with screws, so those all come out for annual inspection. So you can see all the cables and the guts and make sure everything's still safe down there. Um, the rear seats, they do, um, they're the Atlee's folding rear seats, so the backs come forward as do the front seats, so you could lower all these and then be able to load stuff, big stuff, through here. Um, um, and then these rear seats, they also release here, and I actually haven't even done this yet. And then they fold up like that. So that was cool. You can do the same thing with the other side, and now you have all this baggage area. Mm, <laughs> Next year, are you looking for a Super Cub or a Cessna? Hmm. Um, so, part of the way the raffle works is the Typically, the Airman's puts out a request for proposal um, to a whole bunch of different companies, manufacturers, you name it. And then everybody who wants to puts in a bid. And uh, we did bid again this year for, for 2021. Um, we have not been selected yet, so it's all part of the process. Um, but we bid for another Cessna 180 because I think this was a really big hit and it was fun to build and my family members buy tickets so it gives me another chance of <laughs> winning it. well 
it beat theirs, but um, no, it's it, it was a fun build, and there's some things that I would like to put on another 180 that we didn't have the time to put into this one. Not to say that we'll have the time for next year's either, but uh, yeah, that's yet to be determined. I think the end of May is when they're supposed to announce the next builder. So Patrick would like to know, is that the factory leading edge on the wing? Uh, Patrick would like to know if that's the factory leading edge on the wing, and it is not. It is a sportsman's stole kit from Steen Aviation, and essentially, actually if you come up here to the wing route, you can see, you almost have to probably get underneath and look straight up at it, but you can see this is where the original leading edge would, would have been, right here, and this is the additional leading edge here. So you can see it sticks out a, about two and a half inches or so, and it also droops down, um, which gives you more wing area and allows you to fly slower. So, um, any more questions or should we wrap this up? You done? I could stay here all day talking about planes, but. <laughs> um, so tomorrow, tune in at 4.30, right here on our Facebook page, or on the Airman's page, or on the Airman's website, when we announce the winner of that sweet baby. Okay, just a few more questions. Okay, we got a few more questions. Is there any soundproofing installed? Uh, is there any soundproofing installed? And no, well, yes and no. There's not your standard insulation. We were trying to keep it light and not add unnecessary weight. Um, with that said, there is a firewall blanket. So there's a fully insulated sheet on the back side of the firewall that um, reduces sound and reduces any engine heat coming through the firewall heating your feet up um, and then there's the david clark headsets that are noise canceling and they're amazing when i flew it you don't hear anything it just puts that thing on and just goes boom, drowns out all the sound so and there's two of those for both the front seat occupants and then earplugs for the back seat so how do you secure gear are there any tie down rings um there are not any the question is how do you secure gear are there any tie down rings um there we did not install anything like that um it is something that could be installed later um, but there are the rear seat belts so you can wrap your cargo with the rear seat belts which we actually made extra long so that that could be accomplished um, and then the i believe atley dodge has tie down rings that can be put into those rear folding seat rails. So you can just click, click them in there and then you can put straps or cargo net or whatever you wanted onto those. Does it have flap gap seals? It does have flap gap seals. Sarah's rolling through the questions, see if we didn't miss anything. Stall fence? No stall fences. And that's a good question. So is there any stall fences? And we actually, when we got the plane, it had a different stall kit on it. And we, uh, it had the stall fence, which, which is a, it's a blade for lack of a better term that sits on top of the wing, right between where the aileron and the flap meet. And it goes all the way down the top of the wing. And the idea there is when you're slow, the airflow will try to roll out and off the tip of the wing. And that fence holds that air over your flaps and keeps it in place. Um, but I actually talked, so this had a different leading edge on there. It was a, an older version and not as good as the Sportsman. So we actually took that leading edge off and put this leading edge on. And I talked to Steen Aviation in the process and said, hey, should we leave these stall fences on or should we take them off? And they said that they've 
done a bunch of testing with, with them on and with them off, and they said that they don't make any difference. And he said, you're just carrying around extra weight. So off the stall fences went. Will the prop clear with skis on it? Will the prop clear with skis on it? Uh, very good question. And I don't know the answer to that. Uh, that would take some paperwork research. Um, essentially what they're getting at is when you have your prop blade down here and you have skis on, your skis aren't as tall as your tires, so the airplane's going to sit lower to the ground. And when you're in level flight attitude, like you were going to be touching down in a wheel landing uh, attitude, would that have enough clearance from the ground? Um, this is a CAR-3 airplane, which is C-A-R-3, Civil Air Regulations. Um, because of the year it was built, um, those regulations require a 9-inch prop clearance when you're in a level flight attitude. So that would be the research that would need to be done is, does it have that clearance? So I don't know, but probably. We good? We got all the questions answered? Um, you guys probably also might have noticed the hangar looks a little different. <laughs> we spent the last two days cleaning this place that has never been this clean, which is really cool because now we get to start over and hopefully we'll be even more organized now. Um, but we're in preparation for tomorrow's event and it's going to be a little busier in here tomorrow. Um, we're going to have the airmen's here, we're going to have our crew back, and we're going to kind of try to replicate what we do at the actual gathering, which unfortunately is not happening this weekend. Right now we would be at the show with this airplane. Um, so tomorrow's a big day. Christmas has finally arrived after all those presents we got to open along the way. Um, tune in tomorrow, it's gonna be exciting. Get your popcorn, relax in your recliner from home and see if you win either this or one of 11 other amazing prizes. Um, tomorrow, 4.30 Alaska time, which is 5.30 Pacific Coast time, which is, what, 9.30 Eastern time. Um, yeah, do the math, figure out where you are, where, where, when Alaska is at 4.30 tomorrow, and tune in, plug your phone into the TV, the big screen, watch it live tomorrow, 4.30 Alaska time. This could be your bird. have more questions they can keep leaving yeah. them in the comments and yeah if you're watching this after it goes or the live feed ends um comment we'll try to stay on it and answer your guys's questions um also don't go too far away how long sarah do you think until you have the maiden voyage video up 20 minutes oh maybe 20 minutes so don't go too far away come back watch the maiden voyage you get to hear that prop you get to watch the airplane actually fly Believe it or not, it has, and there's proof on the way. So tune back in in about 20 minutes, and we'll have a video posted. Awesome flying video. And crank the volume up. So see you guys tomorrow, 430.